On a, ser- on a serious note, I, I just want to say, men, fathers, thank you for being faithful. May, may you continue the journey. Today I want to ask you, what do you declare about your life, your life's priority, your life's purpose? I ask you that because we as fathers, and as I said before, I'm going to speak to fathers, but because the Word of God is the Word of God, every one of us here need to hear something today because God's Word is living. So it may be pointed at fathers, but it's to all of us, whether we're single, whether we're teenagers, whoever we are, God's Word has an important passage. I began my ministry 22 years ago by preaching from a passage, Joshua 24. I do it every year. I come back on Father's Day and preach from the same text. I do it for two reasons. Number one, I do it as an anchor. It's a personal and pastoral commitment to you as my church family. It's who I am. It's what I believe. It's my commitment. Second, I want to remind us that the passage, the scripture, God's word, no matter how many times you read something, God's Holy Spirit can speak to you and give you something fresh, something new, an insight that you may not have seen before, or something that you, wow, God, thank you for making that real. So when we do that, it's because I believe God's word has something for us fresh each day. So would you stand together? I want to read Joshua chapter 24. I'm not going to read the whole chapter, just a few verses. If you're familiar, Joshua begins the conquest of the promised land after Moses passes away in Deuteronomy. The book of Joshua is about all the land they cover, and now they've come to the end where Joshua gathers the nation together, and he says that we're going to have a final covenant renewal. We're going to remember who we are and what we're committed to. And he says this, verse 1. Then Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem, and he summoned the leaders, the elders, the judges, and all officials of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. Joshua said to all the people, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says long ago. And then Joshua gives them a kind of historical review of all that God has done and through Abraham and Moses, and now he's brought them up to this place. And over in verse 14, if you'd pick up with me. Now... Fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your forefathers worshipped beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Father, as we read this passage, would you open our hearts, God? May we not be lulled into some kind of familiarity that says, oh, I know what this is all about. But may we open and say, Jesus, what do you want to speak to my life today, I pray in your name. Amen. You may be seated. If you'd allow me a moment, I I want to bring you back in my own life, my own journey, because it's important, I think, to revisit significant moments in your life. I told you about how important camp was for me and why I think it's critical for, for young people to engage in a time like that. I believe our journey of faith is marked by decisions and and declarations of what we believe and what we are committed to doing in our lives. I I believe that the success of our life is measured in how faithful we are to God. I'm probably the only person that still has this little piece of paper, but it's 22 years old, and it's in my desk. I keep it in one of my drawers. It's a little program we had on my first Sunday here when we installed me as the pastor. And there's a section called the Pastor's Covenant that from time to time I'll pick up and I'll reread. Because what it is, it's a, it's a statement that I made, a promise I made 22 years ago as pastor. It says, I pledge to you a stewardship of my responsibility as pastor to live before you with integrity and Christian simplicity to responsibly administer the affairs of the church in consultation with the church board and the church staff, to carry on the work of the body, to lead you in worship as a worshiping leader, developing a careful regimen of study, prayer, reflection, and preparation for the purposes of personal growth and ministry. I pledge to encourage you, comfort you, instruct and challenge you. I pledge to seek always and in all appropriate ways to expand the border of the kingdom of God, to live responsibly my roles as husband and father, giving my family the care and love due them as gifts of God to me. To listen carefully to you, care deeply for you, work closely with you, 
and pray daily for you to be a servant leader after the example of Christ. And I read that to you because it's a reminder to me of my declaration personally as a father, as a husband, as a pastor. And that who I am and what I do is held to what I've committed to saying. That we are the people by which our lives live out our convictions and our declarations. And what we say we are has to be masked by what we do to say, I am consistent with that. Am I perfect? Oh, no. Have I blown it? Oh, yeah. But I I say that to you because on this Father's Day, that's my pledge. God, I want to declare that I want to be a faithful servant to you, to my Father. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's been words that I've longed to fulfill, and I say, God, help us as a church to do that. So, men, I want to challenge you. What have you decided to do with your life, and what do you declare before your world, and most importantly, before your family, as to who you will serve and how you will serve it? So I thought this morning on Father's Day, it'd be good for us to hear from one of our own. So would you welcome Al Ruiz as he comes up and uh, shares a little bit? Brother? All righty. Al, take the microphone. How many of you guys, y'all know Al? Al is a wonderful man. Good guy. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I, uh, happy Father's Day to all the fathers. Uh, I want to apologize. I'm starting by apologizing for, uh, I'm not a really good speaker. I'm a little nervous up here, uh, but, but here we go. So, no apology needed. <laughs> uh, I would like to start by saying that I, uh, I uh, was born in, my name is Alvaro Ruiz, it's, um, and everybody knows me as Al. I didn't grow up in the church. I was born in Chihuahua, Mexico. I've uh, been here most of my life. I, uh, I um, grew up in Mexico and then in Arizona, New Mexico, L.A., so I've, I've been everywhere. Um, I didn't grow up in the church again. I, uh, my father was a, a, a good dad. He taught me to be a hard worker, uh, provide for my family, uh, but he also showed me a couple other things, uh, you know, like closing bars and when I was eight years old, uh, multiple times, uh, seeing him do things, you know, drinking, uh, drugs, uh, and a, several other things that I got him, I got to see. And, and he was my role model. He was my, uh, he's my dad. I wanted to be just like him or if not better than him. Uh, and I started following those steps at a very young age, um, uh, getting into, uh, uh, the drinking, uh, at a very young age, I started, uh, experience with heart, heart, with drugs. Um, and they had no idea that that was kind of free. And I just, anyways, so, um, so that was that with my father. I, uh, in, uh, hi- high school, I, uh, my girlfriend got pregnant in, uh, when I was 19, uh, I was a senior in high school and, um, uh, how to grow up, you know, telling my dad that my girlfriend was pregnant was probably the hardest thing that I had to do ever. Even though when I was, he was raising me, he kind of gave me the, the open door to just, uh, do whatever you want to do, and I got your back. You know, you don't have to worry about anything. Mm-hmm. So, okay. Um, a lot of hurting. Yeah. Didn't really have uh, a relationship with God. I'm baptized uh, Catholic, and I really don't know what that is. And I saw my family go from being Catholic, uh, then they went Mormon, and then from Mormon to Catholic. So church, religion wasn't really, you know, I didn't know yeah. what, but... Um, anyways, uh, lived in southeastern Arizona, uh, worked at a tire shop there at a, at a Walmart, uh, making $3.75 an hour back in 97. So trying to provide and raise a, a, a girlfriend and a kid was a little tough. So I started doing offset things, you know, doing a selling drugs, doing whatever I had to do to, to get ahead, because that's what I needed to do. I needed to provide and take care of my kid. Mm-hmm. Um, and I uh, started hanging out with, with people that um, the end result was not going to be good. And I knew that. Um, uh, out of those, we were five of us. Out of, the, out of five of us, two of them are no longer with us. One of them is in jail for life. Uh, one of them went into the Navy and, uh, and ended me. So... Um, like I said, didn't have the best, the best uh, upbringing, I guess I should say. 
Um, anyways, so got the opportunity to uh, move to California. My store manager at Walmart got recruited to come work at uh, Montgomery Wards in Modesto. And uh, he said, hey, what are you doing? You know, you're a hardworking guy. I like you. You've got great work ethic. Um, why don't you come with me? And uh, I'm like, oh, you know, I, I, I need a change, right? So I was like, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. So I approached McKenzie, my wife at the, uh, now. Um, hey, I'm going to go. I'm going to go to California, and I'm going to go um, check it out, see if it's something I like. And if I like it in a month or two, will you come up? And she said yes. And, uh, and we did move to Stockton, uh, California. And uh, uh, then we, moved, we, we were working in uh, Modesto, worked there for two, three years, managing the Montgomery Awards. I learned a lot. That was my college. Uh, um, and uh, I was able to bring McKenzie and Anthony up with me and, and buy, you know, got a, an apartment, and I was, I was doing good. I was on top of the world, you know, I, uh, making good money. Uh, then I got recruited by another real, re- retailer, moved to Sacramento, uh, and did even better. So, you know, by 21, I was, uh, you know, making about $100,000 a year with no education. I thought that was pretty well, and I just worked. I was a workaholic. Um, I would leave my, leave my house at 6 o'clock in the morning, get home at midnight sometimes, 11 o'clock at night. Uh, no relationship with my kids, you know, I, uh, um, or my wife. I had money, and, uh, you know, my way of showing my family that I loved them was by buying them things and taking them places and uh, didn't have that closeness of relationship uh, w- with my wife or the kids. Um, so I started, uh, I met this guy, uh, Mo, a Muslim, uh, in Sacramento working at a retailer and uh, we started going on our own and we started buying houses um, and, you know, refinancing, pulling money out, buying another one, doing this. So got to have uh, the one that I live in and three more. Uh, so I made some good money really fast. And, uh, but I still, I, I will go home and, and uh, I can see my, my, my wife wasn't happy. I started noticing a change on Anthony, my oldest son. Um, he was getting a little mouthy, um, just no respect, and, and I just knew that, okay, why is he like that? Because I'm not around. He doesn't have a dad. He has a dad, but he's not around. So I was like, you know what? I need to make some change. So I decided to, to leave what I was doing in Sacramento and just, you know, just quit, whatever. And I had money at the time in homes, and I was doing really well, so I thought. And... Uh, and I moved to, well, I got a job in Jackson, work at Jackson Tire right now, and I've been there. It's going to be my 10th year in, in August. Um, took a huge pay cut, making less than half what I was making over there, stuff like that. But I was home. I was able to go to these games, be more involved with them, you know, and, and I thought that was a good thing. And then uh, around 2008, uh, I had the opportunity to get out of all these houses and sell them and just... My realtor called me and said, hey, I think we need to do something, get rid of all this stuff. And I'm like, nah, I'll hold on another six months, and I'll refinance again, and then I'll get rid of them. Well, that didn't go very well. Um, Had them all rented the same month, every single house. uh, They stopped paying me rent. And everybody remembers what happened in 2008, right? Okay. Yeah, uh, no rent. So what I'm doing, what what was I going to do? I'm responsible. My credit is what got me everything. I can't ruin my credit, so I started making the payments myself, obviously, for all these homes. So you have four houses, you know, about $13,000 a month. Uh, in a year, it goes, uh, everything went pretty, pretty fast, and I lost everything. I lost all my money. Um, I was uh, very down. I couldn't, couldn't help my family in Arizona when they call, hey, son, you know, can you lend us 3000 Can you lend us this? Or I uh, couldn't do that anymore, so I, f- I felt like a failure. Um, I didn't have nobody to talk to going through this. I didn't have a friend that I can say, hey, I just need somebody to talk to just to, just so I can unload, and I didn't have anybody. I felt that the friends that I had, that um, a lot of them owed me money, so every time that I would call them, they, uh, they maybe they didn't want to talk to me. Maybe they thought I was going to say, hey, I need my money or something. You know, I just wanted a friend. Um, so I got very depressed, very down. I just fell into a dark hole and I couldn't get out. I, uh, like I said, I felt like a failure. And uh, but through all through this is what well, this is happening. 
a lot of people will see me and be like, oh, this guy's very successful, you know, he has a house, beautiful family, uh, nice cars, you know, he dresses nice, whatever. I'm really good about putting a, a mask on and just what I, what I show you is what you see. Um, so one day I go to work and uh, um, my, the owners, you know, pulled me aside after work and they're like, hey, Al, how's everything going? Uh, it's going good. It's going great, you know. And uh, they're like, really? Yeah, yeah, what's going on? And they throw the, the newspaper in front of me. And they're like, uh, isn't that your name? And I'm like, yeah, isn't that your house? Your house is going to be sold this, you know, at the courthouse, you know, Monday. And I'm like, yeah. So things are not good. So it just hit me, mask off, right? And I was just down. I was like embarrassed, you know, loser. And uh, they're like, hey, anything that we can do to help you? And uh, we'll help you. We like you. You're a good guy. Um, you know, we're, you've been doing a great job for us. You know, what can we do? And, oh, no, I don't need no help. I got it. So at that point, guys, I was uh, going from every cash and go in town borrowing money. I would borrow money from this one to, and then pay off this one and go to the next one to be able to try to pay my mortgage and try to feed the family and, and whatever we needed. I just, uh, like I said, I didn't have anything. I drained my 401k that I had, my IRS. I just, I just went through all of it. And, um, and to add to this, I started drinking a lot, uh, like a lot every day, just go home and wouldn't have that relationship with my kids, my wife. I would just go and hide in the garage. We have a detached garage from our house and I like working on cars. So that day, I, uh, and I was very depressed. I was uh, contemplating taking, taking my life and just, just ending it. And uh, I had a good life insurance. And uh, you know what? The house will be paid off. The, um, the wife will have money. Uh, the kids will have an education. And it'll be done. No more, no more stress. No more worrying about money and this and that. And uh, I, uh, I, I, I was like, you know what? I, I'll dis disconnect the airbags. Uh, no seat belt. I know what tree at what speed, and uh, it'll be done, right? So, uh, <laughs> how selfish of me to think about that. I look back right now, and I look at my my family over there, and I love my family so much, and I can't even imagine my mom, my dad, my wife, my friends, everybody, if I would have done that. So. Going back to that day when my boss approached me and offered to help, and I'm driving home that day, and my car starts acting up. It starts missing, like the transmission is going to go out, and it's the only car that we have at this time. And I'm like, really, really, you know? If you love me so much, why, why are you, why, why me? Why are you picking on me? Why? I'm just angry, yeah. angry. And uh, I get home, and I'm just, did I say that I was angry? Uh, mm -hmm. McKenzie tries to approach me, whatever, hey, how was your date? Don't talk to me, just leave me alone. So I go to the garage, and I just start trying to, to, to work on the car. I'm going to figure this thing out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fix it. And uh, I have some ramps, and I'm trying to, to you know, get the, the car on top of the ramps, and, and it's not working. Every time that I try to do it, the ramps just keep going forward. And I'm like, okay. So I get a jack, and I, I place it under the, the driver's door, and I lift the, that one side of the car, and I get underneath it, and uh, don't see anything. And this is by the time it's maybe around 10:30 at night, and you know I was drinking a little bit, and I uh, I'm getting out of the car from underneath, and it's a you know it's a BMW, so it's really low to the ground, and the jack just gives out, and the tire just goes on the side of my face, and I hear a voice that tells me, I can take your life any time that I want. And I'm just like, I just sit there still, and I'm just, okay, great, now I'm hearing voices, you know, I just, okay, so I managed to get out from the car, and I stand up, and there's a, a window, and I can just see my reflection, and I'm just pale, I'm just white, I'm just shaking, and I'm like, okay, I need to, I need to relax, and I walk outside the garage, look towards my house, and I see uh, the TV's on, somebody's still awake, and I just go through the side, and we have a back deck, and I, uh, I go back there, and I'm just, I just sit there, and I, I let it out. I say, God, help me be a better father, a better son, a better husband. Help me manage my money better, Lord. I just can't do it anymore. 
I just can't. I, I'm done. I, I just can't. I need your help. Please help me. And uh, what happened, guys? It's amazing. He, uh, I heard his voice. He told me, stand up. He said, enough of you walking with your head down. Like that. Like, I just, and I'm up. And the next thing he tells me, he said, Bible. Grab your Bible. And I'm like, Bible? Where's my Bible? I, you know, Mackenzie's uh, grandparents sent me this Bible years back, and I've never really opened it. Um, and I remember, I remember where it was. So I was like, it's in the trunk of the car. So back to the garage I go, and I open the trunk, get the Bible out, and he tells me, just open it. And I open the Bible, and it lands on Proverbs. And I'm like, what is Proverbs? It says here, why you should read the book of Proverbs. If you're looking for helpful life pointers, you come to God's one-stop shopping store. Almost everything issue of, uh, er, almost every issue of life is addressed in Proverbs. How to manage your money, how to get, get along with your relatives, how to raise your children. It's all here. The book of Proverbs is God's guide to your life choices. Thank him for directing your path. <laughs> From that day on, guys, I didn't, uh, I didn't win the lottery. I didn't come across a bunch of money. I didn't change jobs. All I did is that I placed my life in, in his hands, and I opened the door for him to come in and restore me, and he has done that. I don't stress about that anymore, about money anymore. He, he provides for us every day, and I don't know how to explain to you guys how it just happens, and just happens, and I just give, and I help whenever I can. I might not have a lot of money to give, but I give my time to people and, and help, and, and he has blessed me with a great family, great wife. She's my best friend. Uh, my kids, I have a great relationship with them. I, uh, I pray for a little girl, and he blessed me with a little girl. I, uh, I just, I'm just thankful and, and, and just grateful that, that I got to, that I have a relationship with him, and that I am not alone, you know, that I'm not in a dark hole, and the day that I fall into a dark hole, I know that he is there, and he is there to lift me up, and, 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 and guide me, and I would do the same thing to my, for my kids, the day you guys fall into the dark hole, I'm here to, to lift you up, to carry you, to guide you, to, to be there, to tell you that I love you, and you're not alone, ever, always know that, okay? I, um, and that's it, you know, I just, yeah. uh, just to see, uh, amen, yeah, you've, uh, you've changed the family story from the role model you had to the role model you're giving, amen, amen, so yeah. would you say that, uh, your declaration is, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, yes, amen, amen. get up for so. out, praise the Lord, good job, Amen. Wow. Well, that is uh, it's powerful. It's a real-life story. And to think you could have taken the easy way out. But God didn't let you. You see, what we saw in Joshua, we saw it take place in Al's life. There's a context. There's a setting. There's a, there's a choice to be made. And so as Joshua said to the people, look, you guys, you got to choose for yourself whom you're going to serve. These gods in the country here or my God. Al, you're going to serve the God of money, God of power, God of toys, God of relaxation or whatever, or you're going to serve the God. And so the story is simply, what are you going to do? Fathers, what is your choice today? What is your decision? What do you value more than anything else? What is the declaration of your life? I said last week in our message, as we talked about parenting, that we have to understand the landscape of the land in which we live, the culture in which we live, and the challenges that face us. And Joshua told the people, look it, we've been conquering the promised land, but it's not done yet. There's still a lot of things that can suck you into their way of life. You've got to make a choice. Are you going to serve the gods that the Canaanites serve? You know, the gods of pleasure, the gods of these gods that have no moral conviction, they just do whatever. 
Or you serve the God who called you, redeemed you out of slavery, has given you purpose. Are you going to serve the God who says, this is how you live, holy unto me. And so he challenges them. And church today, it's no different than when Joshua was here. The challenge is before us. If you remember, I gave you a verse last week. I'll remind you, 1 Chronicles 12. It's simply told about the men of Issachar who understood the times and knew what they should do. And I would say today, fathers, do you understand the times in which you live and do you know what you should do? Do you know what God is calling you to do? Do you know the pitfalls that are out there that are facing your family, the temptations, the struggles? It's very real. And the calling upon all of us is what do we decide we will do? What will we be known for? What is the creed of our life? What is the declaration we make if you wrote something out about your life, fathers, what would it say? That when I die, I want everybody to know that I was what? I made a lot of money? I was the best 49ers fan? What would be the declaration? See, that's what Josh was saying here. He's about to die. He said, I don't care. I don't want to be known for the guy that conquered Jericho. That's fine. What I want to be known for is that as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord God Almighty, and that doesn't matter what everybody else does, because that's what our declaration is. And for you and I, we're the same thing here. What will we commit ourselves to? One of the things that happens is the decisions we make, and if you're like me, from time to time, I like to watch some, some movies that are historical in nature, and one of them I watch from time to time is the miniseries The Band of Brothers. It tells the story of, of the men of Easy Company on D-Day and, and the ongoing saga. And there's a section in there that talks about one of the lieutenants that comes up there. And, and the narrator, as they, they see the scene where the, the, the lieutenant is just kind of frozen in indecision. The battle's raging and men are getting hit and he's not making a command decision of what to do. And the narrator says that it wasn't that Lieutenant Spears was a bad man or that he made bad decisions. It's that he made no decision. That hit me. Because in our life, if we don't make decisions, they will be made for us. Something will decide what will happen to your family. Something will decide where your life will go. If you make no decision, a decision will be made for you because you are relinquishing the decision that you have control over. And Joshua says, look it, you've got to choose for your day who are you going to serve. You've got to decide. What will your life be known for? You've got to declare it. You've got to commit to that conviction and live it out. You've got to say, this is who I am. Al said, this is who I am. I want my family to know. I'm not afraid for my kids to know who I am and what I'm about. Awesome job. Fathers, this is so critical. We have to declare who we will be, what kind of family we will raise, what kind of life we'll serve. I, 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 was, I watched a little clip of a, of, a, of a movie clip not too long ago, and it hit me. Now, please, don't, don't make comment about what movie it was. From time to time, Hollywood actually allows something of profound meaning to be put into a movie. So I want you to hear, the, hear the, the, the quote here. In one of the last scenes of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, <laughs> I, I hear the words. The professor says to Harry, Dark and difficult times lay ahead. Soon we must all face the choice between what is right and what is easy. And that hit me. People, dark and difficult times lie ahead. Please understand, I'm not being doom and gloom. I'm just doing reality. When a bunch of Christians in Egypt are killed because they're Christians, dark and difficult times lie ahead. When our children are being bombarded with things that they're being taught as this is what you have to believe this is how you live and they're contrary to what God's word spells out this is dark and difficult times and we all will be faced with a decision between what is right and what is easy what do I mean by that 
the easy thing for the Israelites was to just simply fall into and fit in to the culture of the Canaanites. Because after all, man, their gods they worship, there was a lot of, a lot of just no big deal. Oh, yeah, free sex, gods of this. There's no moral code to obey. Just do what you want to do. That's the easy route, Joshua said. But you've got to choose because the right thing to do is to serve the Lord your God all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And people, it's really easy just to ignore what goes on in our world. It's really easy to stick our head in the sand and say, well, not too long from now, God will come home or I'll go home and I'll be in heaven. I don't have to worry about it. But if you're a father and you know the culture that your children are going to inherit and your grandchildren will inherit, there's no time for the easy route. It's time to choose what's right. And the right thing is to say, God, your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Your word, O oh God, is a lamp unto my feet. It's a light unto my path. Your word, Father, is how I know how to raise a child, how to be wise in my stewardship. Your word is will guide me into making good, godly decisions. Hey, folks, I'm not being doom and gloom. I'm just laying it out for you. What's the declaration of your life? Easy way or the right way, which is to follow God all the way? You know, Jesus said, Narrow is the path. Please understand, Jesus did not say that following him makes you narrow-minded. Uh-uh. Narrow means that there's a right way. And few walk on that. Why? Because the narrow way isn't the easy way. The easy way says, I don't want to take responsibility for my actions. I don't want to take what's morally true. I want the easy way. I don't want to be, I don't, no. Choose for this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, Joshua said, I'm going all in for God, the narrow way. Heart, soul, mind, and strength, everything for him. Amen?